New Year. Welcome to Larry Edmonds Bookshop. Do we have any people never been here before? Brand new, yay! So we have lots of returning friends, we have new friends too. I'm Jeff, this is the Larry Evans Bookshop. We're 75 year old bookstore, 76 years old this year. And we are a performing arts specialty store, but we do all kinds of shows and have all kinds of fun. Uh, if you're new to our store, we welcome you to sign up on our email list at the front counter. And we also have a Facebook page under Larry Evans Bookshop if you want to look up there and see all our great events like our event today with Daryl and with our special guest, June Foray. We're so glad to have them here today. We have some upcoming events uh, in the next few days. We do a series with some, a group called Live Talks Los Angeles, and they do a whole variety of shows, but there's some things coming up with authors and chefs and Chelsea Handler and all kinds of people. And here, our next event on the store will be on the 30th. Next Thursday, spend the night with the unknown comic. Oh, right. <laughs> Murray Langston is coming, and he's going to bring clips. We're going to watch him on the Gong Show and Sonny and Cher, and uh, he'll be doing his signing here. And then the following week, February 7th, 8th, and 9th, I'll have all the stuff posted lately. Three events with author Victoria Wilson coming out from New York for her Barbara Stanwyck biography. Um, a thousand pages of Barbara up to 1940. Nothing's ever even been close to this, right? There'll be movies at the Arrow, there'll be a show in here, there'll be one at the Marwick House in the Valley as well. So look, find all the information on that and lots more fun. Mark Vieira for films in 1939 at the Egyptian, lots of stuff anyway. So without any further ado, Daryl Van Sitter is the author of this fantastic book that I have waited literally a lifetime to have here, The Art of Great War. Daryl, thank you so much for being here today. I'm not going to talk long because we're here for June, not for me, but uh, I started this book only because I had already written a book on the making of Mr. Magoo's Christmas Carol, and that doesn't seem like it would have anything to do with Jay Ward, but there's a lot of crossover on the artists between the two books, and when I started getting in deeper and deeper, I realized there was a lot of great artwork that nobody had ever seen or even knew existed about these uh, terrific Jay Ward cartoons. So I started digging and digging, and uh, fighting the legal battles with all of the companies that own the IP. And uh, after a year and a half, I was able to get this thing done and published just in time for the Peabody and Sherman movie coming out shortly. And uh, so here it is. It's what I call four and a half pounds of animation history. So uh, enjoy it when you get a chance to actually read it. And uh, June will be signing them. Um, the DVD, we picked out four cartoons, two Rocky and Bullwinkles, one Dudley, one Fractured Fray Tale. I picked them out to highlight June's voice work because that's who we're on here. So uh, without further ado, if Jeff is ready, we can start running some of those. Oh, whoops. I forgot to do this for you before we uh oh, the people came. Everybody say cheese. Cheese. Oh, and June. If you could say the immortal words for me as we start. <laughs> and now here's something. What? You want me to say that? I would love it. Oh, listen, I'm just delighted that uh, my friend here wrote the book on Jay Ward because I think that was one of the most delightful periods of my life, working with Jay and all of the actors. I'm the only one left. So I'm grateful for Daryl for what he's done, and I know all the people. So here's something I hope you really like. <laughs> Thank you, 
remember the trustees of Wilson and you were wondering how to keep their college from going bankrupt. How about giving an honorary degree to Danny Warbucks? You, Manny, he's only a make-believe character. Were you real? In the end, of course, they followed the lead of so many other colleges, they decided to get a winning football team. As a result, two scouts are trying to sign a bullwinkle. Lord, do you know who these fellows are? Pick and Pat? No. Gallagher and Sheen? No. Null and Boyd? Thayer and Boyd? No, they're scouts. If they're scouts, let's see them rub two sticks together. They're football scouts. Then let's see them rub two footballs together. Let's check the little old rule book, Edgar. Uh-oh. Model? Says here we can enroll anybody except a moose. Let me say that. Oh, Chauncey, that doesn't say moose. No. That's mouse. <laughs> Hot diggity! Come on, sign. Okay. X! Bullwinkle, you know how to spell your name. Yeah, but I don't want to look like a show off. That's Humble, not... that's me. Yeah, but... Mr. Modesty. But... When it comes to humility, I'm the greatest. So I see. And so it came to pass that a few days later, Bullwinkle Moose arrived on the campus of Wasamata U. It's like a beautiful dream rock. There must be a catch in it somewhere. You sure you got everything, Bullwinkle? Well, I see. I'm wearing my bell-bottom trousers and three-tone shoes. Yeah. I got my ukulele and my hair stick on. Uh-huh. Do you have your textbooks? Don't bother me with details, bro. <laughs> Mr. Moose, I'm your counselor. Now, about your classes. I just wear them to read. No, no, your classes. I gotta go to class, then? Of course. I told you there was a catch in it somewhere. Now, I'd suggest you take introduction to chemical kinetics, differential calculus, and the history of the Peloponnesian Wars. Take them? I can't even pronounce them. Boy, they sound tough. I'll never have time to play football. Oh, you're a football player? The frostbite falls flesh. Wanna see my clipping? From your last game? No, from my last haircut. It won't be necessary. You'll take the regular classes for an athletic scholarship. Which are? Personal grooming, crocheting, and reading modern classics. That last one sounds tough. What modern classic do I have to read? Dick and Jane at the seashore. <laughs> well, that's more like it. I'm afraid so. Well, how are you making out, Flash? Just dandy fool, Mr. Scout. You know who this is? Of course. The Scout Matthew. No, this is our coach, Rocky Canute. <laughs> what a damn pal. Oh, thanks a mill. It was getting the mic heavy. Maybe you better suit up, Moose. In a few moments, Bullwinkle was attired in his very own football uniform. Bullwinkle, you're barefoot. Yeah, I like to feel my toes grip the earth. Besides, they didn't have any size 22s. Well, let's see you draw one, Moose. Throw a game already? I haven't even started <laughs> practicing yet. Not a game, a pass. Let's see you draw a forward pass. Okay. How's this? And Bullwinkle played it back, cocked his arm, and fired a forward pass that traveled. A miserable ten feet and fell to the ground. How's that, Coach? Coach? Gee, where'd he go? Over to dead feet, that's where. Well, is this the end of Bullwinkle's sports career? Be sure to see our next episode, The Hidden Ball Play, or Goal is Where You Find It. <laughs> Once upon a time, in a large forest, there lived a woodchopper, his wife and their two children, Hansel and Gretel. It was a beautiful forest full of trees, flowers, butterflies, and streams. Matter of fact, there was just one thing missing. Food! I must have food! Food? Food isn't everything, dear. No, but it's something. But we have the trees, the flowers, the butterflies, the streams. What more could a body want? A square meal, that's what. Okay, spoil sport. Now you might think that in a forest as big as this one, the woodchopper would be able to bring back some game for the table. But a curious thing happened to him when he went out. He just couldn't pass a tree without chopping it down. Well, and after all, a woodchopper is to chop wood. So each night the woodchopper would come home with lots of logs, but no food. And what good are logs? You can't eat them. Who says? Oh, yummy. Anyone for roast leg of log? Well, we better split and get some food, Hansel. Yeah, it looks like Mom's a little kooky. Kooky?
cookie. Oh, I wish I had a cookie. <laughs> so, taking a few precious grains of parched corn, the children set out for the forest. Hours later, Gretel began to worry. When we found food, how do we find our way back? Easy. Remember those grains of parched corn? Well, I've been leaving them as a trail so we can find our way home. Some neat plan, huh? That plan is for the birds. And so it was. The birds had eaten all the corn. Hopelessly lost, the children wandered about until Hansel suddenly bumped into something. Something that wasn't a tree. Watch your step, stupid. You bumped right into that gingerbread house. Gingerbread house? Oh, isn't it cunning? Cunning? It looks good enough to eat. Have a piece of shutter. I'm more of a shingle and doorman myself. And in a few minutes, Hansel and Gretel had eaten a big hole in the little house. Then suddenly... Nibble, nibble like a mouse. Who is nibbling at my house? Oh, there's always a catch. You're a wicked witch, aren't you? Well, yes. And you got all kinds of magic powers, true? Well, no. You can't breathe fire and smoke? Nope. I just get dizzy. You can't summon up demons? I don't know. Hey, you demons! <laughs> you got no magic powers at all? Well, there is one thing I'm pretty good at. Turning children into aardvarks. Yeah, at that you're pretty good. But I don't really care much for aardvarks. Then why do you keep changing children into them? Because I care even less for children. Besides, I have the witch's tradition to uphold. Isn't there something you'd rather do? Oh, sure. I'd like to know how to ride a broomstick. Broom, boy. But what's the use? I'll never get off the ground. If I show you how to ride a broomstick, will you change Hansel back again? Of course, of course. But you aren't even a witch. Oh, come now. There's a little bit of the witch in all of us, girl. Give me the broom. Now, you take this broom. Yeah, yeah. And you twirl it all around. Yeah, yeah. Now you put it on the ground. Oh, yeah. And you sit right down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now you tell that broom. Now, boom, boom, boom. Right on the roof. Yeah, 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 yeah. And sure enough, Rachel began to fly. Now but unfortunately, the witch hadn't asked how to turn the broom off. So, once she started it, she had to keep on going. And in a little while, she was in orbit around the Earth, where she remained to this day. But she did keep a word, for as soon as she had gone, Hansel turned back into himself. And so did Oddbox all over the world. In fact, <laughs> Oddbox might have become extinct if it weren't for the fact that some Oddbox decided that they'd be happier <laughs> remaining Oddbox. At any rate, Hansel and Gretel packed up the rest of the witch's house and started off. Of course, since they were in a magic forest, they soon came upon a huge talking duck. Oh, duck, uh, would you tell us the way back to our cottage? Je ne comprends pas. Yes, unfortunately, <laughs> this was a French talking duck. But he indicated that the children were to get on his back. Uh, and down the river they went. After a long while, the duck said, Et voilà, nous avons arrivé. Which is uh, French for end of the line. Oh, joy! How again? For there, sitting on a log, was their father. Not with his axe, but with a musket. Father, why aren't you chopping down trees? Oh, Gretel, I finally decided that all that glitters is not trees. You can't buy happiness with trees. Besides, I chopped them all down. Now it's hunting. Hunting is the only thing. So, from that day on, Hansel and Gretel had plenty of food, and their mother never went hungry again. You know, sometimes I wish he'd stuck to his wood chopping. when the tired Monty sits down to dinner and gets his just desserts. And just what does the tired Monty do after dinner? Well, if he's anything like Dudley Do-Right, champion of the oppressed and all-around goody two-shoes, he goes for a swim in the river. Master Lynn is a rotten egg! Which is just what he had eaten for dinner. The rest of his fellow Monty's remained in the dining hall, however. Well, you see, this was the middle of winter, and the river was anything but swimmable. By the time they got him out, Dudley's warm outlook on life had cooled considerably. That ice is certainly thick. So is your head, Dudley. The vision of loveliness administering first aid to our hero is the haunting and ever-popular Nell Fenwick. 
Axiom that they have been engaged for 22 years. You need someone to take care of you. I have my horse. You need a woman. What is a woman? I am a woman, Dudley, and I have decided to let you marry me. Ten minutes later, they stood before the preacher. And if there is anyone present to object to this union, let him speak now. The gentleman about to object is Dudley's lifelong enemy, the malevolent, snidely whiplash. I don't know what it means, but I object. Whiplash, you cur, so you will ruin my wedding, eh? As a star for yes. Dudley picked up the thing nearest to him, which happened to be now, and threw it. Aha! I have her, and you shall never get her back. Or any other part of the problem. Do right. Give chase. What? And miss all this swell food? Far above Cayuga's waters, that snidely whiplash's sawmill, scene of many a tragedy. Why are you doing this, you devil? Because, Miss Fenwick, beneath this black exterior, there lies a mustard plaster. And over the mustard plaster, there hangs an acetate bag. On it, imprinted in pica, are the words, Whippy loves Nelly. What I'm trying to say is, I love you. Well, let's say I like you a lot. But I despise you. You won't be mine? Never. But I can't have you, neither can do right. He climbed Mel to a loud pull. And started her on her way to the teeth of a giant saw. Fortunately, the conveyor belt was in need of oiling, and the trip was a slow one. I must get word to Dudley. Mel was in luck, for as Whiplash stepped out of the back door, a mailman stepped through the front. One of them new weight reducing machines, ma'am. Quick, sir, are you en route to the mountain folks? No, but I'm a going there. Taking a pencil, she scrawled the word help on a sheet of paper, stuffed it into an envelope, addressed the envelope to Dudley to write, then fainted from the exertion. Two days later at the post, Nell's father and Inspector Fenwick chatted with her. <laughs> I haven't seen Nell lately. Come to think of it, I haven't either. Perhaps she's visiting a sister. Does she have a sister? No, but Nell's a strange girl. At that moment... Uh, I ran all the way from Whiplash's sawmill. I have an urgent letter for Constable Do-Right. It's from Nell. I'd know her penmanship anywhere. Yes, it's from Nell, all right. Well, aren't you going to open it? That would be against the law, sir. You see, there isn't a stamp on the envelope. And there you have the reason why Dudley rode to the sawmill, dashed inside when Nell was still on the way to the saw, talked her into sticking a stamp on the envelope, dashed outside the sawmill, <laughs> rode all the way back to the post, and said to the inspector, It's from Nell, sir. She needs help. Well, stand there, do right. Don't just do something. It took them an hour and a half to straighten out that last line. <laughs> but eventually, Dudley was on his way to the rescue. Would he make it in time? Oh, save me! Save me! Somebody save me! Don't go all to pieces now. Wait about five seconds. It looked like Nell Fenwick's wick was about to be extinguished when... The jig is up, Whiplash! Dudley, the saw! Pull the lever! He pulled the lever all right, but the one that said free wheeling. The saw rotated madly, broke free of its moorings, and ate its way around the mill. Frankenstein! Within five minutes, the sawmill had been reduced to sawdust. As for Whiplash, he was last seen heading in the general direction of downtown Toronto, closely followed by the saw. Oh, Dudley, my hero! No, my heroine! At approximately 11.10 the following morning, every available mounted gathered on the post parade ground. Constable Durack was to receive the Canadian Pretty Good Conduct Medal. Uh, before I begin this idea, do right, when are you and my daughter going to be married? Oh, I'd say in about ten years, sir, unless she gets out before that for good behavior. You see, I had to arrest her for mail fraud. The stamp she stuck on the envelope? Blue chip, sir. Against all regulations. <laughs> well, Bull Winkle's career as a football player had uh. quite a setback last time when Coach Canute said... Well, most do you think you can pass? I don't do. I'll study hard. No, no, I mean a forward pass. <laughs> oh, that. Sure. How's this? <laughs> and Bull Winkle left at a forward pass that didn't travel more than ten feet. That's a forward pass. It went forward, didn't it? Turn in your suit, Moose. No, wait. I think I know what's wrong, Coach. Let me send her the ball. Okay. One, two, three. Now, Bo Winkle, Allie! Well, it was the alley oop that did it. The football zoomed into the air, down the field, over the goalpost, out of the stadium, and across the campus toward the administration building. Now, Chancellor, this here stadium will cost you only $7 million, and we can start building on a lot of money, Mr. Herdlicker. I don't think we... What's that? It's a football. How did it get here? Offhand, I'd say it was thrown here by your new fullback. Well, don't just stand there, heard like a bill something. And immediately, work started on a brand new stadium for What's the Matter You? While on the practice field, Bullwinkle and Rocky worked out with the rest of the team. 
Oh, I got it. I got it. Gee, not so hard, Bullwinkle. That's the third pass receiver we've lost today. We don't lose it up. They pick him up in the next county. But passing wasn't Bullwinkle's <laughs> only football town. When he put his head down and charged, he could take up one whole side of the opposing line. That's what I like, a player who uses his head. It's also good for hanging hats on. Game time for Wasamata U's first game with the Watchmakers Technical Institute. <laughs> or as it is known, tick tock tick. It wasn't a game, <laughs> it was a slaughter. A minute before the end of the game, with Wasamata U leading 66 to nothing, Coach Canute took Bowick out. Immediately things were different. In the next 60 seconds, Tic Tac Tech scored 60 points. But then the final gun sounded. Well, a big upset like that didn't go unnoticed. Whoa! Look what the newspapers say about the game, Rock. I don't see anything. Look down here. What's about a 66? Tic Tac 60. The tape's too small for me to read. But as the season progressed, the headlines got bigger and bigger. What's the matter, you? 90. Barely normal. Zero. What's the matter, 89? Purdy Polly, zero. What's the matter, 150? To Coins Grammar School, zero? Little mix up in the schedule then. What's the matter, was the only team in the nation which was undefeated and untied. Not untied, we're just as loose as all. But on television, every silver lining has a dark cloud, and our show is no different. For in a downtown bat cave uh -huh. in a large city, some professional gamblers were posting betting odds on Ooh. next week's game. Oh boy, you see the odds on what's the matter, you? 200 to 1. Incredible. Well, Natasha, this is it. This is the time for me to turn over a new leaf. What? You know how I am, honey bun. Always destroying things, wrecking them, smashing them up. Yes. Well, now I'm going to do just the opposite of breaking things. You mean? Yes. I'm going to fix a game. <laughs> He's just the fixer to do it, too. Oh, don't fail to see Wager at Dawn or Early to Bet. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm going to take some questions. Sure. Uh, anybody have any questions that they would like to ask? Hi, so when we were um, recording the um, soundtrack for the cartoons, were you in the same room with the other actors? come in in the afternoon, pick up the script, read it once, and go through it. And you never expected a, a, an old-time actor who just did pictures and stage to come in and do that. And he was incredible. Can you tell me, uh, tell us a little bit about the, the formation of the J Word Studio and uh, Maybe a little bit about how the Bowinkle, the Rocky and Bowinkle project came to uh, Late in the 50s when TV had really caught on, Jay decided maybe it's time to get back into the animation business, so he started up again. And, but he didn't have, he didn't have a, really a shingle to hang out, he didn't have any place, he didn't have anything. So he, uh, he uh, was mostly working from Berkeley, but he hired some artists down here from UPA to work freelance for him. And uh, <clears throat> two artists, Sam Clayberger, who's still with us today, and Roy Marita started making the pilot for Rocky down here at Crossroads in the World. They had a little back office space there and uh, made the pilot there. They did, neither one of them knew how to animate, so they would do all the drawings on paper. Sam would cut them out and put them on cells. 
And in fact, the only animation you see in that pilot is uh, is dialogue animation. <clears throat> they were able to do that much for it. And uh, when I started doing this book, I talked to Skip Craig, the editor of the show, and he said, yeah, that pilot's still around somewhere. It's probably in a, in a vault down on Seward here in Hollywood. So I started asking around to see if I could get into that vault and find that pilot. And of course, uh, nobody wants to spend that kind of money to go digging. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> I happened to mention that to Sam Clayberg, who worked on the pilot. And uh, Sam said, oh, you know what? I think I have a copy of that here. And a friend of his had taken the 16 millimeter print he had of that, transferred it to DVD, so I was able to see it. Basically, the pilot was lost for 50 years. And nobody knew it was just sitting in his drawer somewhere all of this time. So we were able to see that, and you'll see clips of it, or frames of it in the book. <clears throat> and once they, it took them a year after they made that to get it sold. Once it sold, everything changed for Jay Ward, and you know, he, things just took off. And uh, one of the next things he did was, was Dudley Do-Right. Dudley Do-Right he'd actually done as, as a pilot back in 1948, and uh, it, didn't, it didn't get picked up, so he brought it back in 1961 and, and completely revamped it. The pilot for Dudley Do Right is actually the UCLA TV archives down here, and uh, it's on a videotape. And I tried to use images from that in the book, but there were legal reasons, so I was not able to put that in the book. So if you ever come to one of my other presentations where I actually deal with the artwork side of it, I, I do show it in, the, in those presentations, but uh, not able to show it most of the time. Anybody have any questions? Anything for Jim? What's the next thing? Viva do the, he said, no, 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 we're having too much trouble with Russia now, so just be continental. So, so that's what I did with Natasha. But it was so much fun to do. Well, you can tell that we were having a lot of fun. Did you have any inspiration for Rocky himself? No. No? Just, no. just a kid's He voice. just said, he's a, a little... Funky boy, and that was a. So I, I tried out a couple of lines, and he said that's fine. <laughs> Jay was easy to get along with, but he knew what he wanted, and he got it. <laughs> so, he really did. Yeah, it was great. You know more about his background than I do. <laughs> My you goodness, with him. his book is an incredible book. Wow. <clears throat> And all the places are still around here. I mean, you can go see his old his old office down there on Sunset. You can see Crossroads of the World. You can see where his his private office was, which has been the uh, Andalusia Apartments right around the corner. All still there. Now I know the statue is. The statue was taken down. Tucked away was, right now, right? It's going to be restored. We're going to. Yeah, the statue was taken down. I can't. Can't people can't hear me? Can you stand up? No, stand up. Okay. <clears throat> The statue was taken down a few months ago because it was in bad repair. And uh, <clears throat> nobody knows quite what happened to it or when it's going to reappear, but supposedly it was at the DreamWorks studio for a while. Then it was moved over to the Warner Brothers lot where they can actually do the repairs. And now the repairs are being affected. So I assume it will be brought up back again in a presentation to help promote the Peabody and Sherman movie. Okay. Nobody knows for sure or where it's going to be put out. So, but it is coming back. It's when. being refurbished. It's being refurbished now. Yeah. 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 Um, you don't really hear that much anymore about the Hoppity Hooper, uh, Uncle Waldo, or whatever the series was called. Um, but there was different characters involved, and and I'm not sure which ones June did. Uh, but uh, is there? You know, it seems like Tom Slick and and Super Chicken and George of the Jungle. And there's movies made of it, but you, you never really see them quite as much. Yeah, um, Hoppity Hooper's kind of a lost property. It didn't. It wasn't that successful at the time, and it was only it was one cartoon, and they, they recycled a lot of the other cartoons from uh, Total Television Productions and their own stuff into it. So there was very, very little new stuff in every show, and it was not a big hit. And I can't. I had to go out and buy bootlegs off of eBay in order to see it, to write the book. In fact. Uh, that was the only way you can see it now, because it, it does. It's not popular enough for them to put out any DVDs on it. Yeah, um, I remember they, they they ran it on television in the very early '80s. The last time I saw it was was in the 19, early '80s. They ran that series. Yeah. I was like, oh, you know, I haven't seen it since. You know. Yeah. I'm asking. Yeah. Nobody, nobody, nobody even knows about it. Although hopefully the book will help revitalize interest in it. I did a whole chapter on it there. 
But yeah, it was. It's kind of a shame. That was one show June didn't. If she did voices on it. She did miscellaneous characters because the the frog's voice was done by uh, uh, non-black Chris Allen. Uh, which is her and, and the George the Jungle series. So that was popular, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. That's how I. Mean. But you still don't see that too much either. No, you don't. Hopefully this movie will revitalize a lot of interest in Jay Ward product. I sure hope so, yeah. yeah. Super chicken forever. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you yeah. yeah. I'm curious how I got into doing the uh, television, television commercials with Captain Crunch and stuff like that. Yeah, that's covered in the book. He, uh, he didn't like doing television commercials because Jay didn't like to be told what to do. He wanted to do his own thing and he wanted to just be funny. And uh, <clears throat> so... Uh, the agency came to him and asked him to put together a proposal, and he, he kind of didn't take it that seriously. And uh, actually, he left for a fishing vacation up in Vancouver Island and uh, left it behind. And then he called while he was on the road, pre-cell phone days, he called while he was on the road and talked to Alan Burns. And if any of you are familiar with the television history, Alan Burns was the guy who co-created the Mary Tyler Moore show. And he asked Alan to take a whack at it. So Alan quickly put some, a presentation together, and they got Roy Morita, one of their standard A-line artists, and they put together a presentation, and, and the agency people showed up like a week, two weeks later. They did the whole song and dance. They didn't think it went over well. A couple weeks later, they get a phone call, got the gig, and uh, from and uh, part of part of the original reason that, that Jake took the even let Alan do the thing was they had talked about a possibility of doing a series based on the series. It would have been a Captain Crunch TV series. So that was a part that interested him. It wasn't the commercials. And then, the, uh, of course, that kind of died. We know there never was a Captain Crunch TV series. But this, the Captain Crunch commercials went on for 25 years. So it was a very lucrative contract for him. Did he also do Crispin Quake? Yeah, he also did Crispin Quake. Another agency came to him. It was still Quaker Oats, but another agency asked him to come up with something else. And then, did something riffing on the letter Q because that was Quaker's first letter. One of the things I always love about those cartoons is you can go back, you can watch them now and appreciate elements that are in them as an adult that maybe you didn't get when you were a kid. I mean, they worked on both levels. Yeah. Um, his mind obviously was, you know, they were very good with the writing and everything. And I know he was the same with the promotions and the campaigns. like the Musylvania statehood campaign. Can you talk a little bit about that whole story? Because I think that was a, I mean, didn't that end up in, isn't there a story where he yeah. tried to do that and it didn't end well? Is that yeah, yeah that actually, thing? the whole idea of creating a 51st state Musylvania was to help promote the bowling club show. He didn't feel that uh, NBC was going to be very good at promoting his show. Because when he had a show on, a Rocky show on ABC, they did not promote it at all. NBC was starting down that same path, so he decided, decided to come up with a whole campaign called Operation Loudmouth, and that was his way of getting attention for his show. And so they came up with a whole idea of a campaign for statehood for Musylvania. Musylvania is up in the upper reaches of Minnesota. They actually went and leased an island to create the state and did a whole campaign. They had a, designed a van, painted the whole thing up, glued stuff to it, and the whole bit, drove across country campaigning for statehood and ended up at, uh, in front of uh, 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. They, they wanted to get Kennedy to uh, to give them access so they could talk about statehood from Musylvania. And unfortunately, they got there just as the Cuban Missile Crisis was hitting. And uh, they were asked to leave. <laughs> so nothing ever came of it, but there was a lot of cool swag, little clip on buttons, and campaign and literature. Hmm? They should have Morrison and Mr. Pasha go instead. Exactly. <laughs> Yeah, so that, that never happened, but uh, it was a fun fun campaign while it lasted. Um, about how long did it take you to make the book? It took me 18 months from the first pitch to getting it to the printer. That was, believe me, that was an intense 18 months. I, I had not intended to do it that quickly, but DreamWorks kept moving their release date around, and uh, I wanted to hit close to that movie because I wanted to draft on their publicity. And uh, so I was, I was working like a maniac on that thing. But when I was putting together illustrations, most of which people said there wasn't any Jay Ward art there to be, out there to be found. And I dug and dug, and I got a lot from the Jay Ward family. They did have a lot in their files that they were not aware of. 
could find a lot of other collectors from all over the country and ended up with over 5,000 scans. So there was a lot of artwork out there, just nobody knew where it was. And uh, it took a lot to winnow that down into the book and to get everything into a shape. And still, you can see it's a heavy book. It's a lot of material. Yeah. You said that the, the family had a lot that they weren't aware of. Did you give it all back? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I borrowed it to scan it and I had to return it all. But yeah, I, when I first went down to look at it, all they had was a bunch of 8 half by 11 filing cabinets which, if you know anything about animation art, it's much larger than that. And I figured, this isn't looking good. And uh, so we, look, we looked through the files, and I found a lot of photocopies and scripts and stuff like that, which also was not looking good. And then when I actually went in to start digging through it, I opened the folders, took every folder out of the filing cabinets, and the animation paper had been folded in half. And that's why you couldn't see it. So I, once I started really digging in there, we found a lot of stuff that nobody even knew that they had. So. Thank goodness that they still had it. You know, a lot of stuff was destroyed. And a lot of stuff went to Mexico City and it was never seen again. But oddly enough, when I started doing this book, I was approached by somebody who had two boxes of artwork from an artist who had gone to Mexico City and come back to the States and still had it. So they loaned that to me so I could scan it for the book. So with, like with anything, you start digging and the stuff shows up. But uh, until you dig, you don't even know it exists. Was, I just kind of with the new book and I saw the part <coughs> of Mexico City. Is that what they were actually doing, the animation? Was that studio also the one that was doing those cartoons that looked like J. Ward that weren't? Okay. Yeah, that's covered in the book and why, right. why there was two different like the, sets the, of production companies. Kind of yep. All right. yeah, it's all in there. It will all make sense when you, when you start reading it, but uh, yeah, it's very odd that it all looks it just doesn't quite have that. It doesn't have the same yeah. sense of humor, yeah. yeah. Just too bad. How many years was Rocky and Bowling in production? Five years. That's all. Wow. Yeah. Forever. Yeah. yeah. Uh, maybe June could tell us a little bit about um, some, some of the characters that, like Hans Conried and uh, Paul Fries, that also did voiceovers. I think you talked a little bit about some of the other actors, like Hans Conried and Paul Fries, in the stories. Oh, they were terrific because we were all from radio. And uh, I always said that Paul Fries wanted to be Orson Welles, but he wasn't tall enough. <laughs> but he sure had the talent. Paul could do anything, and he did. And uh, of course, uh, Bill was the uh, announcer. Bill Conrad? Bill Conrad, yeah. yeah. And uh, we had such a good time. Jay liked to work late in the afternoon, so we'd arrive about five o'clock in the afternoon and tell jokes and and uh, Bill and, and Paul would would just grouch at each other all the time. It was all fun, you know. And old Edward Everett Horton, he would come in, read it once, then do it, and then say, Well, I gotta go play tennis <laughs> <laughs> and one day he had a beautiful, heavy shirt. Well, it was a, a, a sweater, really, with one of these thick, thick collars, because it was cold that night. And he said, well, that's my high school sweater. And here he was, what, almost 80? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it, it was so much fun. Everybody had a good time. And Jay really didn't direct us, because he selected us and he knew what we would do with his characters and of course Bill Scott was, was the head writer there too and uh, he was Bullwinkle naturally so it was it was one of the nicest periods of my life because I've done a lot of series and I'm still working but that was fun Jay Ward was a had, did you ever meet Jay? Never did tremendous man and he had this wonderful laugh and uh, he'd tell us a, a joke and boy he was <laughs> all of the <laughs> he was really terrific and um, I didn't know how they got a hold of me but I had been working with uh, Chuck Jones at Warner Brothers and Bill Scott was one of the writers there so obviously when Jay wanted to do the casting, 
Bill Scott said, Count you. And uh, I was doing a lot of series, but that, that was more fun than anything. And you know more about the, the animators. I knew all the animators, but this man did such an incredible study of all these guys that I knew and worked with, but I didn't know their backgrounds the way, the way he does. And uh, I don't know, it was a joyous period for everybody. I'm the only one left. I just asked June while we were sitting here, what, how early did she start working as an actress? And she said, the age of 12. She's been, she's been recording for 80 years, well over 80 years now. Oh, I, I was rocky the other day, uh, a week ago Friday. I was uh, rocky in a Geico commercial. <laughs> yeah. So I don't know when it will be out, but it was a cute commercial. Probably hey, another time another, uh, Fractured Flickers, did you, did, did, the, did the crew come up with that? Uh, or was it just Bill Scott, or did you all interact? Like uh, on the Fractured Flickers show, there's so much to do. I can't hear. That's okay. Fractured Flicker Show, do you remember working on that? Oh God, yes, I was always the Brooklyn Princess. <laughs> and I, one day I said to Jay, you know, I, I've done the Brooklyn for so long, should I do something? He said, stay Brooklyn. <laughs> so I was always the Brooklyn Princess. <laughs> did, you have to, did you have to record that watching the movie? When you oh no, Fractured we Flickers? recorded it first. No, no, but like Fractured Flickers? That was where they took old silent films? Oh, the Fractured Flickers. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, they would show us the what footage. they took, the, uh, the snapshots of all the, the Fractured Flickers that we did. And we just sat and looked at it and recorded. And they were very funny. He had a wonderful sense of humor. Who, Jay? Jay did, yeah. He yeah, was funny. I visited when he was very ill, just before he died, and uh, it was a loss to all of us. But you know more of its background than I do, as all of the people who worked on it, the animators, he knows more about them than I do. Yeah, you know more about the actors. <laughs> yeah, right. Any other questions? We start signing. Nobody else? I would like to say I have done, I don't know how many shows in here, so many, and I'm as happy as I can be to have our guests here today. This is just fantastic. I thank you all for coming to you. If you didn't get a book yet, we've, got, we've still got books up front. Uh, I don't know if there are any copies of June's book left. We have a couple copies of her paperback left, as well as the Art of Jay Ward book. Feel free to step right up and get one and uh, come get our book signed by our guests today. I thank you both very, very much for being here. Thank you, Jeff. Wonderful. May I get you to sign? Oh, and in answer to your question, yes, I did. <laughs> and and, and uh, my daughter did too. That's that. Fantastic. Yeah.